Ahoy, and welcome to the Jolly Reader. I'm your host, Captain Book. I feel like I say it different every time. Okay, so today (laughs) we're covering The Box in the Woods by Maureen Johnson. So this is like a unrelated sequel to the Truly Devious series, but it still stars Stevie. I hate to admit it, but this book is like kind of fitting for spooky season, like for Halloween and September and everything. So you'll see why here in a minute. So today we're going to cover part one, chapters one through eight, pages one through 131. I don't know if that's accurate. I ended up reading an extra chapter, so close enough. I think that might be right. Anyways, things to look forward to, a quadruple murder, homicide, whatever. We don't really have to deal with David that much. I don't know. I don't like that relationship. And way, way, way too many characters. I'll have to make a chart. Like it's all these people from past and present and all their parents and all this ridiculousness and a pointless statue. We'll get into that. So my first note says, oh joy, we start with a probably pointless map of Camp Wonderfalls. So that's where all this takes place. So it goes back and forth like the other books between 1978 and present day, which is like 2020 or whatever. No, probably not because they're not in a pandemic. Let's make it 2018. So we're going to start by knowing from the perspective of the people that are actually there at the time period. And then we got to wait for Stevie to catch up. So let's do it. July 6th, 1978, 11.45 p.m. Oh my gosh, is this stupid already? How am I already annoyed and we're not even at chapter one? (laughs) Okay. So this part is from the perspective of Sabrina Abbott. There's a lot of names, but she's a goody two-shoes and she's breaking the law and they make like a huge deal out of it. This is the 70s, let's remember. So she's with Todd Cooper, who she doesn't like. He's the captain of the football team, blah, blah, blah. So just a side note question. Are characters in books able to be any other position than quarterback? Or do they have to be quarterback? Is there something I don't know? (laughs) So anyways, also with them, they're in his car. He's driving. They're with Todd's girlfriend, Diane McClure, who she does like. But Diane's kind of like a tough cookie, bad girl, whatever. And then she's also with her kind of sort of maybe boyfriend, Eric Wild. And they're not like dating, but they both clearly like each other. And Sabrina mentions that she just got out of a three-year relationship. We find out with who later on. And it wasn't great. It did not end well. So Sabrina's trying something new to relax. Who cares? It's the 70s. They smoke weed. Spoiler alert. And they never call it weed. They call it grass and marijuana. I just, okay, I just don't feel comfortable calling it grass, okay? I got enough problems with my real grass in my yard. It's not a drug thing. That's just a housewife issue. Okay, so Eric's, they, like, in the beginning, they say this is just his stash, but apparently this was, like, a delivery of weed or whatever. So Eric, it says stash in my notes. We'll figure it out. So there's a McDonald's bag that you get your mcdonald's in in a box in the woods which is oh the title the box in the woods so this box is like a hunter's box okay i've said this a gajillion times i don't know anything about hunting but they describe this box is eight feet long four feet tall hunters would get into it there's like a sliver or a hole where they can see the animals and shoot them i don't know okay anyways so they go get the weed or whatever and then they go back to this campfire in this opening and they're rolling and smoking freaking whatever so this is sabrina's first time and she's like i didn't want to go off to college be the only person that's never done drugs spoiler alert, you can go to college without doing drugs okay i did it my husband did it it's not that hard i'm not judging i'm just saying like you don't have to lose your virginity and you don't have to do drugs anyways so todd and diane go off in the woods to like hook up I guess they like take a sleeping bag out there and they're like bye or whatever and Eric's like oh there's no pressure to do that I don't know it's stupid so Eric's like I gotta go pee in the woods okay so they're all high at this point so Sabrina is just relaxing and she's listening to this tape player or whatever and 
she doesn't know how much time has passed, but the tape's like on the second side, so she knows it's been a long time. And she goes to see what's taking Eric so long, and she goes into the woods, and she sees Todd and Diane pressed together on the ground, and she's like, oh, I shouldn't bother them, but I want to know where Eric is. But then she says, something in the way they're laying is unnatural. Then there's footsteps behind Sabrina, and she turns. She thought maybe it was Eric, but somehow deep inside, she knew it wouldn't be. Okay, spoiler alert, they're all dead. (laughs) So then the next part is the student sleuth of Ellingham Academy by Jermaine Batt. So this is just like an article she wrote. It's literally a summary of the last three books in a page and a half. So like go back and listen or just it doesn't matter. Don't listen. I don't care. Don't read these books, though. I'll tell you that. So Albert Ellingham opens the school. The next year, his wife, Iris, and his daughter, Alice, go missing. The student, Dottie, also goes missing. Dottie and Iris's bodies are found, but Alice is still missing. Present day, the YouTube kid major dies at the school and two more would die in the coming weeks. Stevie's and her friends have saved the day and solved the crime. Okay, we know. I wish the three books were that short. Chapter one. My first note says, in case you're wondering, Stevie is still awful. She works in a deli, so that's fun. She thinks about all the annoying people she has to work with and how she wants to cut off their fingers in the meat slicer. That's two pages of my life I'm never gonna get back. And it was disgusting and I have nightmares. (sighs) then at work she gets a call from her boyfriend david who starts a conversation with how's my princess gross not about that which is also really stupid too because it says later right now she talks about how she's never been girly and whatever but he calls her princess so stupid okay anyways maybe that's just a rant that's maybe that's a personal problem so david's working for that voters registration campaign and traveling the country But I have in the last book, he's working for the other people that went against his dad. So, like, I don't know if things have changed. This is the summer after the whole Ellingham thing. Anyways, this is where my note is. She talks about how she's never been girly and it makes her wonder if she's missing a gene. Okay, that's a problematic statement for many reasons that I don't have time to get into. But, like, then she goes on to say, I don't wear a lot of makeup and I've never been interested in prom dresses and I wear a lot of black. Okay, uh, I can relate. You ain't special, Stevie. Okay? You're a normal person. Big deal. Big who cares. Anyways, her parents are all nice to her because she has the boyfriend and she still wants to be awful to them per usual, whatever. She talks about her short-lived fame after solving the Ellingham case, which I'm sure we'll hear about 50,000 times, which we do. Then she talks about how she can't afford a car. If you're freaking famous and what happened to this reward money, like why can't you get a car? Wasn't that the whole plot of the last three books was the money for solving the case and she can't get a car (sighs) plot holes already anyways she gets a message an email and it says read page 25 and 26 so let's do it stevie my name is carson butchwald (laughs) i don't know and i'm the owner and founder of box box which you've probably heard of i've recently purchased a camp in western massachusetts called camp sunny pines It used to be called Camp Wonderfalls. Yeah, that Camp Wonderfalls. I'm making a true crime podcast slash documentary about the Box in the Woods murders. I read about what you did at Ellingham Academy. I like to think outside the box, which is ironic. I know because I run Box Box. And I thought of you right away. How would you like to come and work here this summer and look into the case with me? You could be a counselor at the camp, but mostly you could do what you need to do to look into the case. I can provide you with travel funds and pay you for your time. You can bring your friends if that sweetens the deal. It's a camp. There's plenty of room. If you're interested, get back in touch with me. I hope to hear from you. Carson, whatever his last name is, CEO and founder of BoxBox. It's what's inside that counts. That's like his catchphrase for his business, I guess. Anyways, let's get to something we care about. July 7th, 1978, 7.30 a.m. Brandy... She's another camp counselor, and she's Diane's bunkmate. And the night before, Diane told her they were going out to have a beer and a smoke, and she'd be back by two, I promise, blah, blah, blah. She never comes back, obviously. But Brandy would cover for her, because that's like camp counselor code or whatever. She ain't no snitch. So there's this eight-year-old, because they're camp counselors, that's terrified of going to the bathroom. So Brandy, at night, 
no judgment. I went to camp. I don't know if I was eight, but I was pretty young. I was not a fan of going to the porta potties in the middle of the night. So anyways, Brandy's been up all night taking this girl to the bathroom and she's in a foul mood. So then there's also this other eight-year-old Bridget and she's a nosy and a narc, (laughs) but she wants to know where Diane is. And Brandy lies and says, oh, Diane probably went for an early shower and... She's like, no, she didn't, blah, blah, blah. She didn't take her shower stuff or something, whatever. Anyways, so Brandy collects all the kids and takes them down to the shower area. And Claire comes up to Brandy. This is not the snitch girl. This is the girl that had to go to the bathroom a million times. Comes up to Brandy and says, someone's asleep on the path and they're all sticky. I'll give you one guess what that means. So Brandy thinks that her friend or one of her friends is passed out drunk and is like thrown up on themselves on the path, which is not like unreasonable to think. So she goes to check it out and like clean up her friend and help them out or whatever. And Bridget's following her and Brandy's like, Bridget, go away. So Bridget sees Eric face down in the path and his arms and legs are extended like in a Superman position. And there's liquid dribbled down the path where he landed and all like pooled around him. So Brandy tries to wake him up and she rolls him over and starts screaming. Obviously. Chapter two. That's it. There's like no name or anything. This is back with Stevie. Stevie's reading this stupid book about recreations of murders done in dollhouses that they used back in the day. It talks about it forever. It literally does not matter. But she's doing this to convince her mom to let her go to this camp. She's trying to use like reverse psychology on her mom. So she tells her mom, oh, I got a note from this owner of the summer camp that thought it would be interest or thought I, Stevie, would be an interesting addition for the campers because of what she did at Ellingham. Stevie clearly has never been the outdoor type, which is like the one thing I can't judge her on. But like she pretends to object to this offer and like make it so her mom thinks it was her idea to send Stevie to go be in nature. And this is something Stevie learned from Charles Manson. Great, great Stevie. So anyways, Stevie shows her mom the email from the owner. Read page 38. Stevie, my name is Carson whatever, and I'm the owner and founder of BoxBox, which you probably heard of. I also own a summer camp in Western Massachusetts, blah, 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 we know. So the part that's different says, I read an article about what you did at Ellingham Academy, and I thought it was incredible. How would you like to come work here this summer? You could be a counselor. I think it'd be great to have someone like you on our staff. Our camp is in some beautiful woods we have swimming lakes falls and a great little town nearby with some of the best ice cream in the county it's a fantastic place with great kids you're welcome to bring friends if that sweetens the deal if you're interested get back to me blah 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 so her mom's like oh that sounds great so later stevie tells us that this is a real email from him but what her mom doesn't know that she had responded to him the night before and this is what stevie had responded with Carson, I'm very interested, but I can promise you this. My parents are never going to let me go if they think this is about investigating a murder. Could you write another note about how this is all about camping and doing healthy outdoor stuff? Stevie. So that's clearly what he sent back and she showed her mom. July 7th, 1978, 7.30 a.m. Okay, so this is from the perspective of Susan Marks. She runs the camp and has been for five years. So she's an adult. And during the school year, she's the physical education and health department person at the high school, Liberty High, whatever. So every morning, she goes for a quick seven-mile run around the campground. I'm not about that life. I literally have a t-shirt that says, I hate running. I take my dog for a walk every day. It's like two miles, not seven, and it's not quick. Anyways, after the morning announcements, Susan hears screaming, but it's not like the normal screaming of campers playing or someone almost drowning or whatever. So... (laughs) She runs over to the screaming and she also like on the walkie talkie gets the nurse Magda McMurphy to meet her over there because she obviously thinks someone's hurt. So she gets over there and Claire, the student like that first saw the body, was standing outside her cabin. She's like, tells Susan, she's like, Brandy went down there. He's asleep. But Susan obviously doesn't know what any of this means. So Brandy said like she's freaking out and she's like, I put him back. Magda and Susan go over to Eric's body and they know he's deceased because there's no heartbeat and there's blood everywhere and there's like flies at this point. So Magda's like, we got to call time of death, which I don't know why that's so important, but we spend like a bunch of time on that, 7.45, because that's when they found him or whatever. So Magda, the nurse, turns Eric over and she sees stab wounds and then she's like, what's wrong with his head? Or not like what's wrong, but like, oh my God, look at it. 
So Susan calls up to the lake house, who's run by Sean Greenvale. He's like a teenager, too. And Susan tells Sean, call the police. No need for an ambulance. Then he's like asking what's wrong. She's like, just do it. So then Susan tries to get order and like the other campers and it's like, go to the dining pavilion. Nothing to see here. So then Patty Horn, who's been staying in the nurse's cabin the last few nights as part of house arrest, comes running up. We learn way more about that later. So she says that like, oh, that's Eric. But what about the others? And Susan's like, what others? But we clearly know that there was four of them that went out there that night. Chapter three. So Stevie's on her way to the camp. That's really long. I cut out a bunch of that. But anyway, she tells us that Janelle and Nate will be there. Nate's going to be a librarian living in a treehouse so he doesn't have to deal with anyone. And Janelle's going to be the head of arts and crafts. And Stevie's cover is to be Janelle's assistant. We really don't get into any of that this episode. They haven't even like started working. Anyways, Vi is in... If you remember, that's Janelle's significant other. Vi is in Vietnam for the summer. And David says he can't come because this campaign is really important to him. But he'll come visit sometime. So can't wait to have to deal with David here in a little bit. So Stevie gets picked up by Carson. And the best way to describe him is he's like a hippie. He's really into like no judgment at all. Like this is just how the character is portrayed. Like He does yoga and he's like a super vegan and he's like all one with nature and nothing wrong with that. But I'm just saying the writer makes this like super over the top like, oh, he's like weird hippie or whatever. Not me saying that. So anyways, he says that her friends are already at the bounce house. It's called the bounce house because it's where they bounce ideas off each other. How clever. And Stevie gives us a lot of flack, but I'm like, this is something weird I would say. So they're going to stay in the guest rooms there and then they're going to go to the camp the next day. So also like tomorrow's this big event because it's sponsored by BoxBox, which is Carson's company. He donated a reading room to the town library, 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 and there's a big picnic and he wants Stevie to go because there'll be people from the 1978 there, including witnesses and suspects. Which is a total disappointment. Like, nothing happens. We we go to that at the end of this episode. So anyways, Stevie gets to the bounce house and catches up with Janelle and Nate. And they talk about this trapeze that's in the house and it seems dangerous. They talk about it a ton. So I'm just telling you, there's a trapeze in the this bounce house place. Big who cares? Not relevant, but like, maybe. So I mention it. Could just be like the moose. <laughs> who knows? So then Stevie talks about how Nate's feeling positive and excited to be at the murder camp living in a tree and not seeing anyone. (laughs) And she says that Nate's feeling positive should have served as a warning. Okay, just like let the kid have some freaking happy hormones. (laughs) July 7th, 1978, 8.05 a.m. So we have Sheriff Elliot Reynolds and his deputy Don McGurk. They get to camp. I told you there's a billion people. I'm going to try to help you get it straight. So he brings up this kid, Michael Penhale. That gets explained more. But at this point in time, he just says his business and his reputation are tainted and things around Barlow Corners, that's the town, is like different now. And everything about that situation was terrible, but there was no point in ruining a young man's life over it. And he didn't want another kid to die and or be dead and borrow corners or whatever it explains it more we'll get there so the sheriff and the deputy meet up with susan who explains that one of the counselors was found dead eric obviously eric was clearly murdered with six stab wounds at least and significant trauma to his head they also explain that diane todd and sabrina are still missing Patty tells the sheriff that they all like went out together around 11 to like smoke weed that they hid in the woods. And she tells them like their meeting place or whatever is about five minutes up the path and Todd usually drives. So then Reynolds and Don go to find where the kids meet, like met up that night. And Don asks if they should call the sheriff if Todd's involved. We later find out that Todd is the mayor's son. So Reynolds says, no, we're not getting him involved again. We're going to call the state police instead, blah, blah, blah. 
They drive up the path and find Todd's truck parked. And they also find a blanket on the ground and the fire pit and the tape player and unopened beers and the weed that they had on this cafeteria tray that they were rolling. And the police scan the area and talk about how easily someone could attack the teenagers at night because it's a vulnerable vulnerable location. Then Don says Todd Cooper is a big kid and would have fought and so would have Diane, but like there's no sign of struggle. So the sheriff and Don, the deputy, look around the area when they see something's been dragged and like through the woods or whatever. And there's a piece of green fabric on a tree. And like we know that Todd and his girlfriend dragged a sleeping bag into the woods to canoodle. So the sheriff and Don continue walking and they find a neatly rolled sleeping bag with a tear in the side. And when they approach the box in the woods, they open the lid. There was a terrible smell and it was described as a hideous jigsaw. And a single word was roughly painted on the inside lid in white paint that read, surprise. Chapter four. So Carson explains to Nate his business box box. So every month you get a box full of boxes with themes and they're trying to start bag bags, which is a bag full of bags. Nate basically says how ridiculous it is. But Carson says it's good for the environment and convenient and I have lots of subscribers. So I don't know. There's a market for like pretty much anything. So Carson then puts on a slideshow about the murder. So we get like a ton of information here. So he says in the small town, everyone knew everyone and it was very safe, et cetera, et cetera. Cliche slasher movie. We all know the type. It also talks about how two years before the murders, the town built a statue of the founder, John Barlow. And there's like a photograph of it, of like people at the unveiling of it. And I was like, what's hiding under the statue? We may never know. They bring up the statue a lot, though. So I think it's like totally relevant. Anyways, then Carson talks about the four victims. They were all graduates of Liberty High and all residents of Barlow Corners and all worked at the camp. Shocker. So Eric was 18 and the son of the town librarian and this teacher. He was generally well liked, but could get into trouble. And he was known for being the camp's drug dealer. Okay. Diane was the daughter of owners of the town diner. She was like described as a basic 70s teenager and she was a girlfriend of Todd. Todd was the son of the mayor and football captain. He got into a lot of trouble. We know like more backstory on that. And the misfit of the group was Sabrina, the town good girl and daughter of a dentist. She volunteered at the library and no one could figure out why she was with the bad seeds that night. I said probably because she worked at the library that Eric's parents owned and they liked each other. Wow, that was really hard to figure out, even with this limited information. <laughs> like, come on. So the facts of the murder. Sabrina, Eric, Todd, and Diane left camp around 11 in Todd's Jeep. We know. They went to pick up their weekly pot delivery. We know. The next morning, Eric was found face down on the path in the woods. We know. <laughs> he was struck in the head and stabbed six times. Five of the wounds were fatal. We basically knew. The police went to the campsite to find the others were missing and there was no sign of a struggle yes we know this they found an old hunting box shocker the bodies were arranged neatly diane and sabrina were facing one way and todd was turned the other way with his head between the girl's feet todd and diane both had massive head wounds and were stabbed multiple times todd was stabbed 16 times and diane was stabbed nine times sabrina was the only one without a head wound but she was stabbed 21 times and had defensive marks on her hands the killer bound their legs and wrists in red nylon cord and painted the box lid with the word surprise okay so there's several theories that i guess have gone over like throughout the years so one is that it was a drug deal gone bad but this doesn't make any sense because the drugs were still at the campsite and like there's no motive if you don't take it whatever another theory is the woodsman so this was a serial killer in the general area and he would stab victims and leave them in the woods covered in sticks and he would tie their hands with red cord and write the word surprise somewhere near the scene but like most of the time it was on a tree it was all over the news, so there's, this could have easily been a copycat. The police left out of the news that the woodsman would use torn pieces of silk, silky red fabric, and chalk to write surprise when this murderer used nylon cord and paint. So it's obviously a copycat. 
the cord used was commonly used in water related sports and the camp used them to tie up canoes so like side note earlier susan the head of the camp was talking about how someone was taking the canoes at night like sealing them at night and taking them out so she was trying to like figure out who it was but she kind of chalked it up to like kids being kids but now we can think like maybe someone was stealing this red nylon rope so then we're told which makes absolutely no sense the police got rid of most of the clothing of the victims for no reason Because how could Stevie solve the case if the police did their job? We just wouldn't even have a book. I wouldn't even have a podcast. So they still have Eric's t-shirt and they tested it and it didn't test Woodsman killer DNA that they had, I guess. Duh. Okay. So the third theory is revenge. So the previous December, an 11-year-old Michael Penhale or whatever was struck and killed by a car. No one was arrested or charged and it was written off as a hit and run. But it was kind of common knowledge of the t- of the town that Todd was the one who ran him over. And Michael's brother, Paul, was friends with the victim and worked at the camp. So he would have revenge motive. The night of the murder, the family was home, but Paul was at the camp. Obviously, he worked there. So there was a person that put him at the camp that was Sean said, oh, yeah, I saw Paul. He runs the boathouse. But like nylon cord anyone? He works at a boathouse. They said it's used on boats. Also, Sean is the ex-boyfriend of Sabrina, this like three-year relationship that she said wasn't great. And they had broken up a few weeks prior to the murder. So both Sean and Paul have different motives, whatever. So Carson tells the present day, Stevie, Nate, and Janelle, that their goal for the summer is to make headway on this whole case. Duh. Okay. Chapter five. Big who cares is what it says. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so Carson drives through this town, which is only 2,000 people, and he talks about all the shops and the diner and the ice cream place and all this stuff. Now, I have some issue with this. I used to live in a town that was literally 2,000 people. This is not what it was like. There was not that many businesses. We didn't even have a high school, okay? But apparently, this is huge for what kids? What kids are going to this ice cream place and stuff? There's like 200 kids in this town. Anyways, so they go to this coffee shop with pastries and stuff, and Patty works there. Or maybe she owns it. I'm not quite sure. Anyways, so Patty is the one that was on house arrest that like ran out and was talking to the police and was like, where's the other people? But this is present day. So she <laughs> she talks to Janelle about how she makes some of her cakes. And I have my notes. I said, I could literally tell you how to make a mold of a butterfly and a great cupcake because this book cannot stand to allow me to be happy. Let's get back to the murders. Please focus. So then we like, so we just meet this person. We go back and talk to her, get more detailed. So that's not that important. So then we go to the library and meet who has to be Allison, which is really annoying because they say it like I'm supposed to know who that is. We find out later that Sabrina's little sister, but like, I don't know who Allison is. Oh, it has to be her. Like, what does that mean? So anyways, Allison is, by the way, reuse names much, like pick a different name. I'm coming for this book. Anyways, so Allison Allison is the most vocal of the family survivors and keeps in touch with the police about the case. Well, duh. I would be up everyone's butt if that was me. So anyways, Carson tells Nate, Janelle, and Stevie that he donated the reading room to the library to get the town on his side or whatever because he wants to do this podcast because he thinks his podcast will be worth millions. That has not been my experience in the podcasting world. It's possible but improbable. Chapter six. Carson takes the three people, Nate, Janelle, and Stevie, obviously, to the campsite. He points out a woman named Nicole, who we never meet again in this section, and tells them to agree with everything she says, and we'll work it out later. So Nicole runs the camp, and she's like, this is not about what happened in 1978. Terrible things happen all the time in all sorts of places, and that's in the past, and this is not a murder mystery thing. You're here to work. And then she, like, gives them some basic rules. No night swimming, no jumping off the rocks, no open fires, no drugs, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And she's like, if you break any of these rules, you'll be asked to leave, even if you're here with Carson. Okay, so someone's going to break the rules, Stevie, and not get kicked out because that's how these books go. So Carson goes to give Nate and Janelle and Stevie a tour of the campground. So he takes her. Oh, they talk about this lake. I'm just going to bring it up in case it comes up later. So they talk about this lake that's shaped like an hourglass. And one side, like that's on the campsite, is shallow. 
and safe, I guess. And then there's a road that goes over the narrow part, like the channel, and the other side's super deep and open to the public. I don't know. Someone take a boat into the camp to murder people? Maybe. We'll see. So Carson then takes them to the cabin that Brandy stayed in when she discovered Eric's body. And they're like, this is where we found Eric, right here by this tree. And they say that it looks like Eric was heading back to the camp, but didn't quite make it to like the line of sight of campers before he died. And then they drive to the area where the other teenagers were hanging out in the clearing. Okay, this is super annoying, though. They talk about all the time about oh, if you want to get out to this clearing, you have to drive, you have to drive. But then they talk about how Eric just like ran back to camp. So why do you have to drive when clearly someone walked it? Anyways, it's just stupid. So they get there and he says like the campfire area is like pretty much in the right place because people keep coming to this. So it's like become permanent. And then there's no sign of struggle or any evidence, blah, blah, blah. Then Carson takes him over to where the hunting blind, that's the box, was. I didn't know it was called that. I don't even know what that is. So anyways, he tells them that the police took the lid and then souvenir hunters took the rest. The police really botched this case, even for 1978. Like, holy moly. So Stevie thought like this clearing was closer to the camp, but then realizes how remote it was. And like, you would have to know where this opening area, like, area was to get to it. You wouldn't just like stumble upon it. And then they also talk about how all four of the teenagers were like pretty fit. So how could one person overpower them? And they mentioned that the kids were high or drunk or both, I guess, but still conscious enough for like Eric to run four miles back to camp in the dark and then wounded probably. Stevie suggests that maybe they separated themselves or the killer separated them two by two like the Zodiac. Okay, I hate that though. Like, we know what happened. We know that the two went off to like make out, and then the one went off to pee, and then the other one went off looking for him. We, like, we know they separated themselves. So, like, here we are again, just waiting for Stevie to catch up with what we already know. So, anyways, there was no other tire marks. So, the person or people that did this must have come on foot and came with supplies. And that's a lot of trouble to go through just to kill four camp counselors. I agree. What's the motive? Do we even care? Mm. July 11th, 1978, 6 p.m. Okay, this is weird. There's no narrator. Like, this is not from anyone's specific view, but it's like telling us this is what happened on this day. It's really weird. So anyways, do I know the writing style? No, I do not. So the town threw this like town-wide potluck picnic four days after the murders. Why? I do not know. Just so we could have this part of the book. And there hasn't been an event like this except for two years prior when the statue was revealed at the Bicentennial. Okay, big who cares? What's the point of the statue? So the mayor's mayor is there, Todd's father, and he starts talking to his friend Arnold, the president of the bank, and a doctor, Ralph Clark, who's Brandy's dad. Think Arnold... Mm? That might be Patty's dad. I'm not like 100% sure. Anyways, they would have normally been joined by the town dentist, who is Diane's dad, but the loss of his daughter was too much to show up. So Todd's mom won't get out of bed. So Dr. Clark's like, I'll prescribe her something to help her rest. I don't know. I have no idea if this is important. So anyways, the mayor says to his friends that people will talk about what happened in December, talking about that hit and run. And he's like, my son had nothing to do with it. And like this murder has nothing to do with it. And they're all like, of course not, of course not. But like, you know, people talk or whatever. So pretty much everyone, I said this before, but like things Todd ran down Michael because teenage boys were often reckless, especially when they've had a few beers. And what teenage boy didn't have a beer now and then? With like, I put like 15 question marks. Like don't drink and drive, you idiots. And I'm sorry, not sorry. That's horrible. Don't do it. So anyways, okay. So then this um, like not mystery narrator is like no one ever knew for sure if like Todd did this and no one would ever know for sure. So like, great. Are we not going to figure out this mystery and we're just supposed to assume it was him? Are we like, is this even relevant? So then we're observing Brandy who's sitting with her sister, Megan, and Brandy is having a rough go because obviously she just found a dead body. So she asked her sister, she's like, who could do this? And Megan's like, someone evil, obviously. And Brandy is worried that the murderer will come back. And her sister's like, no one would stick around after doing something like that. 
And she's like, but what if they live in this town? And what if they're planning on doing it again? And I feel like they're watching me. And her sister's like, you need some food. Like, it's going to be fine. And the chapter ends with by saying that Brandy was right. Like, the killer's going to do it again, probably. I don't know. Big who cares. Okay. Chapter seven. I think we have two more chapters. And then we're done, son. Okay. So it's the night of this pick- picnic. picnic and dedication ceremony for the library room. And Carson talks about how he got almost everyone there that's involved with the case. So Paul's there with his husband, and he's now the town veterinarian. So Paul was the brother of Michael who got run over. Patty's there. She owns a bakery and was at the camp, obviously, when it happened. Allison, who's Sabrina's sister, is there, obviously. And Sean, Sabrina's ex-boyfriend, who now owns a sporting goods store, is there. And then Susan, the director of the camp, is there as well. Then they start talking to Allison and Carson introduces Sergeant Graves, who's this female detective that's put, been put on this cold case. And Allison asks if the sergeant can look for her sister's diary. And she explains that Sabrina had it at camp with her, but the family's always been told that it's not in evidence. They don't know where it is. And like Sergeant Graves like, okay, I'll look for it. But Allison's like, they all say they'll look for it and they never do. It's just like a waste of time. So anyways, then Carson gets up to present the Sabrina Children's Reading Room. And then Allison comes up and says a few words about her sister. And then Carson goes up and he's like, this is Stevie. We're going to solve this case. So it doesn't go cold. And I'm going to make a podcast and blah, blah, blah. And the town's like, what in the heck? Like, get why? This is awkward. And then Allison goes up to him, basically calls him out for like donating this reading room just to get like to butter up the town and get everyone on his side, which is accurate. So anyways, she's sick of people coming into town to make documentaries and podcasts. I don't know why I say it like that without actually helping. So Stevie and me and Janelle all leave this super awkward situation and they go sit on the statue that I don't care about. And then Patty comes up to them and talks about how Allison's just upset. It's like opening up an old wound, blah, blah, blah. But not at them, obviously, because they're just kids. Stevie's offended by this. Yeah, you're a teenager in high school. It's fine. So then she asked, Patty asked if they want to go back to the bakery and they agree. Chapter eight. So Patty's back at the bakery and I could tell you that all the different cakes they ate, Janelle had red velvet and Stevie had chocolate. Like, holy moly, I don't need that much detail. So anyways, she's like, I'll talk to you guys about what happened in the camp with my friends and stuff. So she says that her friends were fun and that she would get into a lot of trouble herself with them. So Patty talks about how her mom died of cancer when she was young. And then her dad was like some war hero who basically spoiled her, but like wasn't great with words. So he just like give her whatever she wanted, but like couldn't talk about like emotions and stuff. Then she says, Patty says that Eric was a nice, funny guy and smart. Selling drugs was just low level high school thing. You know, typical drug dealer, like why why is that normal but anyway she thought he would go on to do bigger things and kind of like get his life together so then diane was her best friend but then she like says i didn't know her very well like she kind of kept to herself and she was strong and tough and loved music like really loved music i don't know they really like make that a point and she's a girlfriend of todd we know so then todd was not a good person but She says she liked him because she was kind of like in the inner circle. So whatever. But he was like the big man on campus. So he knew how to like it kind of like drew them in, I guess. And she does believe that he hit did the hit and run and like accidentally killed that kid. And she knew he always drove fast and drunk and high. And someone saw him that night. They don't say who saw him, though. And police did nothing to investigate. Which I'm like saying, how do we not know? Just like insert theory here. They probably saw his car, right? So how do we know like his girlfriend wasn't driving or his dad, the mayor, wasn't driving or whatever? Anyways, she says that Todd was always like cocky after that. I don't know. That's weird. So anyways, she explains that she didn't dislike Sabrina. Sabrina was just like a misfit of the group and they would make fun of her for being like perfect and prissy. And then she talks about how Diane, like the one that brought her over and she started eating lunch with her. Not really sure about that situation. So she says that Sabrina was actually the reason why she didn't go out in the woods that night because she was on house arrest. And she says that this boyfriend, Greg, who she was like obsessed with, teenage love, whatever, but he was not great. He like sold drugs until Eric took over and did it better. And he would like cheat on her, et cetera, et cetera. So Sabrina told... 
Patty that Greg kissed her a few days before the murder. So Patty was all upset, obviously, and she left the camp, but then she was bored. So she went back and Greg apologized and she took him back as usual. And they went into the woods to make up and they got caught. So that's why she had to stay in the infirmary in the evenings and she couldn't even sneak out because the nurse had insomnia. So she was like always up and stuff. So basically she has like survivor's guilt. And then she goes on to explain like after the murders, like everyone's life's changed, obviously. And then there's this big gathering at this football field and her and her boyfriend were there. I'm assuming this was like a memorial because it's like shortly after the deaths. And her boyfriend was high and drunk. Who wasn't in this book? And he crashed his motorcycle on a sharp turn and died that night. So she was left with basically no one. So her dad encouraged her to go to culinary school. And that's how she started the bakery. la di da So Stevie asks her, like, what do you think happened? Like, who did this? What's your theory? And she says the only thing that makes sense is the woodsman or like a copycat of the woodsman. And then she basically stops talking about it. And Stevie, of course, has decided to solve the case. That's part one. Lingering questions. Why can't anyone figure out why Sabrina was there? Like, I don't think it'd be that hard to connect her to these people. And, like, they all work together. And she obviously, like, worked at the library that Eric's family had and stuff. Like, it's not rocket science. Like, it's not that weird with all the information we have. So, Sean, the ex, who works at the lake house, is, like, an obvious suspect. So, it's probably not him. And then Paul, the brother of the kid that died, also obvious. So, I doubt it. And I said, the killer is probably someone we haven't even met yet. Or it's the random boyfriend, Greg, or something stupid. So in closing, thanks for listening. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook at the Jolly Reader Podcast. Subscribe so you get notifications whenever new episodes are posted. Please leave a review to help other crewmates find this podcast. And share. Please and thank you. Share with whoever. If you like secondhand embarrassment, stay tuned for the outtakes. And I will talk to you next time for part two of The Box in the Woods. Until we sail again, this has been The Jolly Reader. Bon voyage. Hey, you made it to the outtakes. Let's do it. Testing. Oh, is my mic on? Okay. Uh, testing. I got my septum pierced yesterday. I'm 30 years old and I was afraid to tell my mother. Then I told her. And she goes, oh, I didn't know those were in right now. You're braver than me. So that's best case scenario. (laughs) I literally got up at 530, composed a text, and was worried about it. Anyways, let's get to the episode. The students, I don't know what this is supposed to say. It says loot. That's not correct. Let's see what this is. Is that the girl's name? I think it's Claire. Anyways. Page 38. That took forever. So after the morning announcement, Susan hears screaming. Do you hear my dog right now? She's staring at me and whining. She's sitting in the chair. (laughs) Stop. The door's open. Go upstairs if you want. Okay. So anyways, after... Where are we at? That pity is a fussy butt. And I'm just realizing that my video did not record at all until now. So I'm going to start the recording and... I'll just have a blank screen, I guess, at the beginning, because oops. Okay, so, oh, Tom's mom, not Tom. I am Allie, and you are with me to my mom.